and he was our high commissioner at UAE, also our ambassador at, in Egypt. So you know that entire area very well. And I would like to discuss the Middle East or India's look west policy today with Mr. Suri. Uh, American plan for the Middle East, the peace plan, the much anticipated peace plan is finally out, which has been instantly rejected by Palestine. But Trump calls it the most pragmatic peace plan, which paves the way for two nation. Uh, and it is uh, uh, nothing is going to get better than this plan. That's what they have to offer. That's what he says. Is Palestine has rejected it. But at the same time, I want to first discuss India. How is India looking at this entire region? We'll come to the peace plan later. Because during the last few years, we've seen India's approach towards the Middle East, towards the Gulf region, has been more pragmatic. And we seem to have shunned our past baggage. Do you really think there has been an upswing and we have dealt with the different countries one on one rather than? And clubbing them all together, be it Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, all of these. So, firstly, um, pleasure to have this conversation. Um, just a minor correction: it's the ambassador to Abu Dhabi, be to UAE, not the High Commissioner, because UAE was never a member of the Commonwealth. Mm. Um, I think the Gulf, in particular, really matters to us. And I think while we had uh, invested so much of time and energy into our look east policy, somewhere we took our eyes off the ball in terms of our look west policy we seemed to have neglected that this is part of our near neighborhood. This was a part of the world which was completely connected with India. Uh, the trucial states uh, were actually run out of the British office in India, mm -hmm. not out of London. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, Dubai uh, and in Bahrain, until 1967, the currency was the rupee, the Indian rupee. And even today, old timers call it uh, the rupiah. Uh, so, so we had these really close connections. We lost them for a bit. And I think uh, if I were to set a defining moment, it was uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit in August 2015, which really turned the tide around for us. And I think it's important to remember that before Prime Minister Modi, the last visit by an Indian Prime Minister was Mrs. Indira Gandhi in 1981. So for 34 long, long years, no Indian Prime Minister visited UAE, which is a country of some importance to us. The reason why the region matters to us is 60% of our oil comes from there. Without that, the engine of the Indian economy would come to a grinding halt. 10 million Indians live there. Uh, take UAE alone, mm -hmm. um, 3.4 million, 34 lakh Indians in, 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 in one small country. We are 35% of that country's population. And last year, out of the $69 billion that came to us in remittances, hmm. $17 billion, almost a quarter, came out of UAE. Uh, and that, in turn, has a real impact on the well-being of so many families in, from Kerala all the way to Punjab and beyond. So, so uh, you know, there are real ways in which this region matters. I, it's the fact that they are all capital-rich countries means today they have the capacity to invest into the Indian economy. And sovereign funds like the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority have actually invested billions of dollars into real estate and infrastructure and renewable energy uh, and, and so on. Yeah. So for all of those reasons, I think it's important that we, uh, 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 we look carefully at this region. Uh, the success of Indian diplomacy, I believe, over the last five years has been the especially cr close relationship that we forged with the UAE and with Saudi Arabia which are two of the major players in that region. With Oman, we always had close ties. And we've done this without com uh, uh, compromising on our relationship with Iran. Uh, and that's taken a degree of skill to make it happen. This region, as you say, rightly say, this is so important because we are a big Indian diaspora lives there. We are concerned because we want to secure our energy supplies. Other than that, we have a very hostile neighbor. We want to checkmate the neighbor there, all of that. But why was it that this area was so neglected and it took a gap of 30 years for Prime Minister Modi to visit? And then what was it that prompted Prime Minister Modi to actually make that beginning in UAE and Saudi Arabia? I think somewhere down the road, for legitimate reasons perhaps for a certain point of time, these countries were very pro-Pakistan. If you go back to the 1965 and 71 wars, they put resources at the disposal of Pakistan. Uh, in 1971, the Saudis actually put 75 fighter jets at the disposal of Pakistan. Mm. They gave immense amount of aid to Pakistan um, and Pakistan reciprocated by uh, 
calling uh, Lalpur Faisalabad, for example, uh, after King Faisal. Uh, and, and, and it had also its insidious impact because the Pakistanis, uh, the Saudis also put a lot of money into madrasas and into yes. the spread of Wahhabi Islam. Uh, and, and the consequences of that in Pakistan are there to be seen even to, the, to this date. So we also started seeing these countries through that prism, that these are countries that are broadly pro-Pakistan. But once we made the outreach, it coincided with the fact that these countries had also changed themselves. UAE, for example, after 9-11, and particularly after the Arab Spring, sees Islamic radicalization as an existential threat and proactively pursues a policy of tolerance. It has a high-profile member of the royal family as a minister of tolerance. Uh, and, and, and so they see this as in their interest that they would rather move away from political Islam and, and uh, work towards creating a more so, tolerant society. Yeah. And in that framework, when we uh, took our initiatives, we found a very responsive uh, country. Uh, and, and, and if I just look at the last one year, mm -hmm. in March 2019, our Foreign Minister, Mrs. Sushma Swaraj, was invited as guest of honor. Yeah to the OIC foreign minister's meeting. Uh, and this was despite sure. all the tantrums thrown by Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, they are not invited or we will not come. And, you know, for us as diplomats to see our foreign minister on the dais, on the high table and the, their seat empty uh, was quite significant. Uh, and then uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, August, after the revocation of Article 370, UAE was amongst the first countries to say that this is India's internal matter. Um, and, and then also present the highest civilian award to the Prime Minister. So you could see the shift that has happened in these countries. So you say there is a shift in the Gulf region, it in Saudi Arabia, and it has moved away from political Islam. The, uh, the, the change is there. Now it does not really fund the madrasas in Pakistan. Or, or, or basically, can we say that for each country now, the economic priorities are what uh, at, is at the top of the mind? I think there is the pragmatism uh, that uh, there's the size of the Indian economy, the markets that it offers, the so fact market that that's driving well, it also. only one factor, one I, factor. I think. Uh, but in India is also seen as a factor of stability and security in the region. Mm -hmm. And that contrasts with the fact that Pakistan is seen okay. as a source of terrorism or of some of the uh, bad groups that are coming out of the region. Uh, and, 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 and so the Islamic card is no longer a relevant card to play in, in, in the India Park equation. It's lost its, its currency. And it's interesting, it's happening at a time when a so called right wing government is here. And then the. Absolutely. And you the know, initiative has been taken by this government. Never short of paradoxes. <laughs> And India's foreign policy also has changed a bit. We seem to be sticking to our, to our own priorities. And uh, w what is basic, uh, for example, Saudi Arabia and Iran, like you said, you pointed out that Iran and Saudi Arabia, we are maintaining relationship with both of them. We are maintaining relationship with Qatar as well, uh, also in terms of Israel and Palestine. So there has been a shift in the way we also look at our foreign policy in relationship with different countries. I think it's a greater confidence on the part of India. Um, for many years, we had perhaps talked ourselves into believing that mm. if we were to come out of the closet in terms of our ties with Israel, which have existed for many years, mm. uh, it would have some kind of a political impact in terms of the voting patterns of Muslims in India. Uh, it was a kind of a mythology that had been mm. built up by successive uh, governments over the uh, decades. Uh, but uh, the fact that we have uh, now got uh, close direct relations with Israel, uh, uh, exchange of visits at the levels of the Prime Ministers without compromising on our uh, support for the Palestinians um, requires a degree of maturity in diplomacy. It requires a degree of confidence that uh, we do not uh, see the region in terms of binaries. We do not see it as either or. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are perfectly capable of uh, maintaining relations with all the principal actors. Uh, when I want to speak about uh, right, Israel and Palestine and the peace plan, the Middle East peace plan which Trump has announced. Now this was rejected by the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, and he called it slap of the century, which was much anticipated, but I don't think anybody thought that it would be very different from what came out actually because uh, Netanyahu was right there by his side. Uh, so how is it? How is this peace plan going to change that region? Uh, because Palestine is a very important factor, the two countries, it is. Trump says it's paving the way for two nations. I'll give you a very personal view on this, Nagma. Um, firstly, I think the peace plan, so-called, 
is breathtaking in its audacity and its one-sidedness. Uh, you know, here's a document that seems to have been timed for release with the Israeli domestic political situation, with Prime Minister Netanyahu going through the uh, charges that he's facing uh, uh, and at a time when uh, President Trump's impeachment hearings are going on. Uh, so it's clearly uh, there's an element of rallying support to two mm -hmm. beleaguered uh, leaders uh, and, and, and sort of rustling up support from the, from the base. To have done it without even the modicum of consultation with the PLO uh, or the Palestinian Authority uh, is, is quite uh, spectacular. When you look at the details of it, uh, and and uh, you know it, it is presented as a real yeah. estate plan rather mm -hmm. than as a as a as a peace plan with all sorts of tunnels and bridge bridges connecting and paves the and, way and for uh, Israeli annexation of the and, entire and West flyovers, Bank. Absolutely. So my sense of this, and mm. uh, I hope I'm not too off the mark, uh, is that this is a plan designed to be rejected, mm -hmm. and thereafter, once the rejection is formally taken on board to present Israel with a faith accompli to annex the areas that it seeks to annex and perhaps to eventually move towards a one state solution because a two state solution will no longer be viable uh, and, 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 and I've heard uh, these voices emanate uh, from Gulf Arabs as well as from some of the Palestinians that maybe we've already gone past that hmm. thing of having a viable Palestinian state and maybe what you uh, are now looking at as a challenge mm -hmm. is can you have a one state in which both the Palestinian and Israeli communities, both the Arab and the Jewish uh, communities, the Muslim communities and the Christian communities that are Arab, can they coexist peacefully and on equal terms? Can Israel remain an enlarged state which is democratic and not just Jewish? Um, or will it increasingly the take, the take a different form. So how do you think uh, India's approach will be now towards the Israel-Palestine? It's treading a fine balance and it has, uh, I don't know if it has succeeded in de-hyphenating Israel and Palestine because when Prime Minister Modi visited Jerusalem, he did not necessarily meet the Palestinian Authority as well. So, But he made a separate visit to he Ramallah. Did made, he did make, make and a he separate visit. The, he became the only Indian Prime Minister to, to act, have actually visited Palestine. So, yeah. you know, and, and that's again, as I said, it's part of our uh, uh, deliberate approach to make sure that we maintain relations with all the. So, is partners. that going to be the case now, e even after this peace plan, where it, it, as you said, it's very one sided and paves the way for annexation? Palestine is rejecting it. So, it, is, is there any dilemma on India's front now, or how do we go ahead well, with for the, this? For the next three or four weeks, I think uh, uh, as we evaluate our position on this, there is an additional elephant in the room, which is the likelihood of President Trump uh, coming, coming to it. So, so, you know, uh, at, at this point of time, we have to be particularly uh, careful in terms of how we uh, present it, not only to the Israelis and the Palestinians, but also back in Washington. Mm. Uh, so um, if you see the statement that has come out from our spokesperson uh, yesterday, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it encourages both sides to, uh, to uh, engage directly with each other uh, and uh, on all parameters, including the proposals offered by the U.S. Mm. We, when we discussed uh, uh, India's interest in the region earlier, and you rightly pointed out that uh, our energy concerns are uh, very big here, uh, but now when we look at Iran and the sanctions that America has placed on Iran, we look at our relationship with America, with Iran, there is again a very fine balance there. Uh, we are, that's why also looking at Russia now for our energy supplies. Uh, how do you see this unfold, especially our relationship with Iran? Chabahar port is there, our interests are there, but we have reduced our oil imports from Iran. And, and, and there was no option but to do that. Yeah. So long as uh, the global economy remains dollarized, uh, uh, the Americans have a disproportionate uh, capacity to influence the well-being of other countries. Mm. Uh, and we saw that even uh, some of the stronger European countries had to eventually fall in line with the larger approach that the Americans were uh, dictating mm. on this. Mm. Uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, we have no desire to do any self-harm to our economy yeah. Yeah. Uh, by taking an absolutist position on Iran. Mm -hmm. We negotiated as long and as far as we could. And when uh, we, we saw that uh, we had to uh, accommodate, we chose to accommodate. Uh, but on Chabahar, by and large, we've been able to carve out an exception. Mm -hmm. 
so, so, so we've been able to maintain, we've been able to persuade the Americans that this really is in their own enlightened self-interest that they also um, uh, agree to uh, our uh, support for the Chabahar yeah. port because the access to Afghanistan and to uh, reduce the monopoly that Pakistan has enjoyed in controlling access into Afghanistan mm -hmm. is something that matters to the Americans as well as to us. There is uh, also the X factor, which is Russia and China in the Middle East. Uh, both of them have their own economic interests. For India, of course, because of the rising tension in the Middle East, we are now looking at Russia too for our oil imports. And uh, the Russian presence in the Middle East has also uh, it, it has consolidated its presence there. China's economic interests also. China wants the region to be more stable. So how do you look at these X factors there? Well, I think as they say, nature abhors a vacuum and that applies to politics as well. So when the Americans step back out of the Middle East, particularly uh, in uh, Syria, Syria. And, and the declarations that were emanating out of Washington about their intent to disengage even further mm. uh, in terms of other countries, mm. Uh, when um, when Gulf interests were attacked, um, the Saudi Aramco refinery or the shipping in the Gulf, and the Americans did very little to uh, to come to the support of their long-standing allies. Mm -hmm. I think the message was clear that it was time for uh, uh, the Russians to take advantage of the opportunity that had presented itself. So, from a point where they had been more or less marginalized out of the region uh, post the collapse of the Soviet Union. They are back and they have reclaimed some of the uh, territory uh, or influence that they had traditionally enjoyed in the region. I mean, I remember serving in Damascus back in the late 80s and every third uh, Syrian could speak Russian because uh, they had such a close engagement during the Hafiz Asad uh, time. Mm. Uh, and so it's Russia has taken advantage of the opportunities and it's come back to assert that they are a player in the region. And in a sense, they have been able to assert that they are a more reliable ally to their friends than the Americans than are, the Americans. that they are willing to stand up when the chips are down. So that's an interesting development that has uh, taken place. Uh, the Chinese, I think, uh, uh, have up till now largely looked at it through a mercantilistic yeah. uh, angle. They have looked at markets, they have looked at ports, but I think we should be no doubt whatsoever that while much of their current activity is um, uh, under the um, uh, cover of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the strategic implications are there to see. Uh, it was particularly stark when you saw the manner in which they acted in Djibouti, uh, where they elbowed DP Word out of a signed contract that they had to run the port for the next 30 years mm -hmm. and uh, uh, muscled in uh, uh, themselves. So, you know, you can see the intent, although currently uh, it is uh, kind of disguised in the, uh, under the garb of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. Uh, one final question, Mr. Suri, you've been, you've been looking at these regions for a couple of years now, being our uh, ambassador in many countries in the Arab region, be it Egypt, be it UAE. Do you think our relationship with this area right now is uh, one of the best that we've had so far or there has been an upswing, the cooperation has been in many areas, be it counter-terrorism or controlling organized crime. Uh, so our relationship right now is at a good level, even though India's image at the international level in terms of its tolerance and uh, secular fabric, it has taken a beating. But with the Gulf region, we are doing good. I would agree with that and uh, that's partly because of uh, our outreach, partly because uh, unlike the Europeans and so on, many of these societies, um, the relationship is also at a very personal level, uh, which can sometimes transcends uh, your other interests. Um, what I mean is that when you have the kind of relationship that say Prime Minister Modi has with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed in Abu Dhabi. It comes with a level of trust and uh, confidence with it. Uh, so uh, we haven't seen the kind of issues that we are seeing in, in Europe, for example, at the European Union. Uh, but again, I say, look at the stance of UAE and Saudi Arabia towards the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they have declared it a terrorist organization. Uh, look at the deportations that they have undertaken of Egyptian nationals out of their countries back to Egypt because of suspected links with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. So you are in a new environment where 
the countries that were seen as more conservative, in particular the Saudis, are today saying we've got no time for uh, political Islam uh, or radicalization or extremism, and 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 uh, we would rather focus on uh, uh, developing more normal societies. So the relationships are more pragmatic now. We can I, say I would, that. I would say absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Uh, that's it from us on this episode of Ideas Factory. Thank you for watching.